Why don't we open in a word of prayer and we'll get uh, into the large group teaching. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for uh, this study. We thank you, Lord, for Ephesians and for Paul. And uh, Lord, we just uh, are staggered by the amount of wisdom that he imparts in such a uh, small amount of verses, but just deep in wisdom. And uh, we pray, Lord, tonight that we uh, are able to impart some of that wisdom as you give me the words that you would have these folks here. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, for 2,000 years, scientists have been baffled and unable to determine why Roman concrete has proven to be longer lasting than its modern equivalent, which sometimes can deteriorate within decades. If you take, for example, the Pantheon in Rome, that has been around for 2,000 years, and that was the largest reinforced, unreinforced dome, and there are no cracks in it. Scientists behind a study published in January of last year said they had discovered the mystery ingredient that allowed the Romans to make their construction material so durable and to build elaborate structures in challenging places such as docks and sewers and earthquake zones. The study team analyzed a 2,000-year-old piece of concrete and a sample that was taken from a city wall in the archaeological site of Privium in central Italy and are similar in composition to other concrete found throughout the Roman Empire. The study revealed that there were white chunks in the concrete, referred to as lime class, that gave the concrete the ability to heal cracks that formed over time. So as there was a crack and there was moisture in these lime class, the lime would disintegrate and fill the cracks and then hold it to be strong. The white chunks were previously overlooked as evidence of just sloppy mixing or poor quality raw material. Tonight, Paul tells us about a mystery that has been unsolved also for thousands of years, but the answer had only been revealed to him directly by Jesus, God's plan of salvation for all. Our scripture passage tonight is Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, which I've entitled, What a Mystery, and I've broken it into three different sections. The first, Ephesians 3, 1 to 6, the mystery revealed. Secondly, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, the mystery's messenger. And then finally, Ephesians 3, 11 to 13, the best is yet to be. So if we look at the first part, Paul now has affirmed to us a period of time where God has made his plan a reality to believers and to believers in Ephesus specifically. And it was a multinational and a multi-regional church formed by the unity of the Ephesian believers. And Paul's ultimate desire was to see other citizens of Ephesus to become part of what these believers were already comprised of. He wanted to see the church at Ephesus grow and that the, the believers in Ephesus to reach out into this dark world and bring them in. Paul uses the term in Christ, and that meant that not only are believers connected to Christ, but they were also connected to other members of his church, a family. Certainly not similar in composition. The, actually, they probably wouldn't have not even associated with one, with one another if not for their in Christ connection. Think about it. Back at that time, you had Jew and Gentile, you had slave and free, you had rich and poor, you had male and female, you had young and old. Outside of the unity of the church, these people probably would not have been hanging out with one another. For this reason, is stated in the first couple verses, one and two, are parenthetical. There's then a run-on sentence that goes from verses three to 13, and that concludes his thought. In between those verses, God's grace to Paul has dumbfounded him to the point that he has to share it with his readers. And his wonderment and thanks to God just pours out in these verses. And you'll see this in a lot of the writings of Paul as he reflects on the grace that was imparted to him by God. And that God would select someone like him who had persecuted the believers to no end and then turn his life around so that he would be the messenger to the Gentile people. Paul wants the Ephesians not to lose heart that he is in jail or question his message because he is in jail. 
he tells that he's at, he tells them that he's in jail for spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. But notice he calls himself a prisoner for Christ Jesus, not to Rome or to Caesar, but he's doing it on behalf of the Gentiles because that's what Christ has directed him to do. Now notice there's no bitterness or agitation. He's upbeat. He knows that this is part of God's plan and offers him the opportunity to tell others about Christ. He never looked down on an opportunity, whether he's in jail or free, he was constantly telling people about what Christ had done in his life. No resignation. Instead, there was exaltation that he had. He said, I'm here by God's appointment in his keeping under his training for his time. Paul knew that God had a plan for Paul's life. And it changed when he met him on the road to Damascus. And from then on, Paul couldn't tell people quickly enough about the grace of God. And think about, do we have that attitude in where God has placed us to witness for him? If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about he saved us to do the good works that he had planned for us to do for him. Paul took that literally and then became one of the greatest missionaries of all time. Paul's location didn't change his mission. It was just a different audience that he was preaching to. He was basically not out of the storm, but he trusted that God would bring him through the storm, which he did many times. Why is he in jail? Well, simply because he was inviting Gentiles to share in the gospel, which ticked off the Jews. You can read about that in Acts 22. Paul speaks to the people outside of the temple, and he basically goes on to explain who Jesus was. And if you notice, in that chapter, in chapter 22 of Acts, they listen very intently to him until he mentions one thing. As he finishes up, he said that God then sent him to the Gentiles, and that set off the powder keg. That's where they grabbed him and wanted to kill him right there until he was rescued by a Roman centurion. Do you think Paul might have understood this anger? Think about when Christ confronted him on the road to Damascus he was on, his way to arrest and imprison Christians. He was hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, and, and he was only going after them because they were believers, and they were rejecting Judaism. And Paul, for the rest of his life, was in awe that all of the people God could have chosen to be an ambassador of the gospel, he chose Paul. God's plan and Paul's point was the gospel of Jesus is radical. Its purpose was always to unite all people, including the Jews and the Gentiles. Radical thinking for this time in history. And by uniting this group of diverse people through their common love of Christ, it would be called his church. And this unity would be on display for the world. And the world being non-believers or those that had not yet heard the gospel and responded and were still living in darkness. He wanted these people united and in Christ, emulating what Christ's teaching had told them, he wanted them together unified so the rest of the world could see, so that they could look into this unity of people that were diverse and that not similar at all, but yet had a love for Christ, but also a love for one another. And so confused were they by this that they would ask, what's going on in there? What do they have in their lives that, that I'm missing? And that's what the plan was. That's what God wanted people to understand. His plan was to have Christians worship together as a common family of believers. And Paul goes on to explain to his readers that this mystery, Jews and Gentiles being united together, was revealed to him by a direct revelation by Jesus. Obviously, that was his reference to the road to Damascus experience that he had that converted his life. And Paul basically is saying, had I not had this revelation, I would have gone on sinning. I would have gone on persecuting Christians, but in God's infinite wisdom, he set me apart to be the one to bring this mystery to the Gentiles, to you guys. And the point Paul wants them to understand is that without this revelation of God, this mystery would not be understood. It took God's grace for the believing Ephesians to understand the gospel and to respond to it. It had nothing to do with them. It was all directed by God. It was all part of the master plan where God loved them before the foundation of the world was set and created a way that they could be reconciled from their sin and reunited with God. It was God calling them to him.
And Paul says this over and over. Don't say it's me. It's not Paul. It's God's work through me and his grace. That's the message that he wants them to hear. And Paul is so humbled to be the one to bring them this gospel. Jesus said to Paul, here is what I want you to do with your life. Stop persecuting me. Instead, I want you to go to the Gentiles. So Paul followed. He obeyed and went to the Ephesians. And Paul's word carries the same authority as the scriptures did because it was inspired by Jesus and it was passed down to Paul who wrote all of these things. So today we too can understand that mystery and the plan of God had before the, the time of, of the earth. And with that understanding, they, as well as we, are hearing directly from God through Paul's letters. Paul wants his readers to know that Jesus is the sustenance and the substance and source of the mystery. And it's not only revealed by God's grace, it has nothing to do with Paul's wisdom. It has nothing to do with any human's wisdom. Now think about it. This is Paul, who studied under Gamal, who was a Pharisee of Pharisee, who had the wisdom of all of the teaching uh, back in the day. And, and yet he is saying, this has nothing to do with my wisdom. This is wisdom that was imparted to me. My eyes were open, so I understood what this plan was, what salvation was, what it meant for Christ that died on the cross for my sins, what that meant to me and what it means to, to you Ephesians as well. And he wants them to know that it's no longer just something that was for the Jewish people. This is now for all, Gentile and Jew, united together in a church that basically is emulating an in Christ. That's what the mystery is. That's what grace does. That's what Paul wants them to know. Nothing they've done, everything that has been directed by God. And furthermore, he tells them, this mystery was hidden in the past, but it's now made known to the apostles and to the prophets, so that th this mystery now is going to move out and be explained to everyone. In Acts 10.34, you see Peter had a vision, basically, that he was visiting or being visited by Cornelius. But before Cornelius got there, this sheet dropped down with all of these animals. And, and, and basically, the, the message was, go ahead and eat. Formerly was unclean, but now, because we want to unite Gentiles and Jews together, you're able to eat food that was prior considered unclean. And basically, he understands that God shows no partiality. God wants Peter to bring the message to the Gentiles as well. He's, he's going to tell Cornelius that he will be welcome into God's family, just like formerly it was just the Jews. And that's what Peter is saying, who we used to con consider the Gentiles dogs, now is out witnessing to them as well as, as Paul is doing. It's an incredible plan that God has put together. So this mystery that Paul keeps referring to, which previously veiled, has been now realized in Jesus. And it has been revealed to Paul and revealed to Peter and to all the apostles and now is being brought to the Ephesians. And Paul didn't stop with the Ephesians. He went to the Colossians. He went to the Philippians. He went to the Romans. He went to the Thessalonians. He went to all of these people telling them the same story. They are now welcome into God's plan, God's plan which has always been his plan and his purpose. God committed to save all, not just the Jews. Well, if we move into verses 7 to 10, we see that the mystery's messenger, okay? And we know that's Paul. And Paul wants to know that he has been authorized by Jesus to be his messenger. Now, you want to stop and think about this. How did he start this chapter? He's writing from jail. He's got an audience that is saying, you know what? We, we're hearing about this Christianity from this guy, Paul, but he's now in jail. Maybe he's a criminal. Maybe we really shouldn't listen to him, right? Maybe he isn't uh, an authorized messenger like he's telling us he is. But Paul wants him to understand, I wasn't a disciple that followed Christ when he was on earth, and they're now apostles, but I was directly, I directly had contact with Jesus. He confronted me on the, on the road to Damascus, and I was told directly what this revelation was. So my authority is the same as those disciples that are now apostles. But yet he's still humble. He doesn't talk about his, his previous resume, about being a scholar and being a Pharisee and being you know, a, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. No, that's all rags to him now. He is hu humble, and he's ba basically saying, 
even though I have the authority, I'm the very least among you. I can't believe to this day that Jesus decided to save me and turn me away from what I was doing. And, and so his, his humility is, is, is apparent. He's saying this mystery now was revealed and entrusted to him, the most unlikely messenger that he could ever imagine. And the gospel message that there is salvation through the death and resurrection of Christ, reconciling sinners to God. And Paul was given a direct responsibility by Jesus to be a minister of God, not by man or by his own ingenuity. It's not something Paul sought after. It's not something Paul studied for. It was a plan that was devised by God and communicated a direct revelation by Jesus to Paul. And he received it and then went ahead and executed it. And Paul knows that God's grace saved him and will also sustain him as he undertakes this challenge of bringing this gospel to the Gentiles. And he knows without God's intervention, he would have remained a self-satisfied Pharisee that would have continued to persecute Christians. Now, you want to stop and think about what God had done in Paul's life. But then stop and think about what God has done in your life. The same dramatic thing has taken place. You were converted as well as Paul by this tremendous grace that God's plan and mystery throughout all time had predestined that you would be part of his family and part of his church. Think about how much Paul reviled Christianity. He would have heard the gospel and had rejected it. Remember, he was the one that was standing by Stephen as he was stoned. And Stephen was prophesying, and he was giving a message even when he was being killed. And Paul would have heard this, and he would have dismissed it as being, you know, malarkey. This is this is nonsense. I'm going to kill you, make sure Stephen's dead, and then I'm going to go after other ones because this is blasphemy to the true God. See, he was staying to the old message. He was not understanding the new plan. It hadn't been revealed to him, and he was still in darkness, just as these Ephesians were. Right, Some of them had become Christians, but there were many more that were still in the darkness that, that Paul wants them to kind of give an example of what it means to have a life changed and bring them into the light, just as he had been brought into the light. And if Paul never forgot that same power that had raised Jesus is the same power that brought him from his animosity and his blasphemy and his persecution of Christians and his hatred that he had towards them. And it's incredible, Paul is saying, that I received this grace. God laid hold of me. He called me and set me apart to share this message with you. Now, what's the plan of this mystery? That's what Paul is getting to in this letter. In Ephesians 1.4, he basically said he chose us before the foundation of the world. We were predestined, just like the Ephesians, to go out and tell this mystery, to share this story with people that are non-believers, your neighbors that are still in darkness. The same challenge is given to us that was given to Paul. And God isn't reacting here because his creation failed. His plan for all of eternity was to reconcile us to him through Christ. Whether we're Jew, whether we're Gentile, whether we're a Buddhist, whether we're a Muslim, all of it is designed to bring people together in Christ. And that's what Paul was amazed at, and that's what Paul was writing to the Ephesians about. And he's saying that same grace that brought us to Christ also unites us to each other. And at the heart of God's plan, or his vision, if you will, is his church. His purpose was to save individuals and connect them to each other in congregations throughout the world. Now, Paul wants the Ephesians and us to understand this concept. We as Christians in a church community are an example to the unsaved world, what unity and community looks like. And if this is done according to God's plan, it's an attraction for the unsaved person who is looking in from the outside. What does he see? Well, people that are completely different gathered together in unity. And they're amazed that they can unite Jew and Gentile and all creeds and all races are welcome into the church if they are in Christ. 
And when they're in Christ, within the church, the love that is then shown to each other and to people outside the church become very attractive to those that are still in the darkness, to the point that they're so curious that they're saying, I want some of that. And you know what? The Ephesian believers back then were responsible for executing this plan that Paul just outlined, but so are we today, right? Our lives combined with those that are within our churches should be so illuminating to the outside world that they're so curious about what has changed your life that they want to be part of it as well. And that means whether you're in a building, in a church setting, or in your home, in your neighborhood, people are curious because you are in Christ and your life is being changed the same way that Paul's was changed on the road to Damascus. And this is what God will do in eternity. He will gather all of these people together that have been saved and are in Christ, and we will worship him forever. That's the master plan that is the mystery that is unfolded. And the interesting point, if you look at this, you see that Satan only attacked vibrant churches, only those churches that shine a light into a dark world. Those that don't emulate Christ, those that are not in Christ, those that are chaotic and arguing and can't seem to get together, Satan loves that. But the ones that are vibrant and doing the things here that Paul is talking about, those are the ones that are persecuted by the dark side. And Paul forcefully lets the Ephesians know that God created all things and he's in total control. Regardless of what's going on in the world, God is still in control. And they couldn't make sense out of their world unless you start with that concept. In Acts 17, Paul's in Athens. And you remember what happens there? He basically says, you know, I've been banging around your town today, and I know you're a very religious people. And I saw a statue there or a God that was to the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. He created the world and everything in it. And in spite of all the turmoil that was swirling around the Ephesian world then, and all the turmoil that's swirling around our world today, God continues to execute his plan today that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago. Think about missions. Think about missionaries that go out into the world. Think about church plants that take place. All of them are following the same recipe and formula that Paul is talking about to the Ephesians. Unite a people that have a commonality in believing in Christ, live a life that is worthy of him, and then go out and evangelize to people that still don't know the story. Didn't change back in the Ephesian day, and it doesn't change today for our churches. If there's a church that doesn't have a strong missions program, then you have to wonder, do they really understand what the word of God is telling them to do about missions? And God wants us today to be bold enough to share Jesus in our individual environments as well. And when this work is done, Jesus then will come back in his time. And Jesus is the core of this whole plan. This is the way these people are united to him. Salvation, conversion, and then basically sanctification, and then judgment. And the church is part of this plan to convert the unsaved. And as we review our world, we have to review it in light of the Bible's truth that Paul is declaring to the Ephesians. God created the world, God has saved the world, and God is going to return through Jesus and bring us back into heaven with him for eternity. All other events that we look at in our world today pale in comparison to these promises. We have been united in Christ and will spend eternity with him. And our jobs as Christians and members of this church is to shine into the darkness of a world that is without God and without hope so that a people that find themselves there might be drawn to the light. That's the task that Paul is, is communicating here to the Ephesians. And not only is he communicating, he's telling them why. And he's demonstrating it that what took place in his life can take place in their lives as well. The final couple of verses talk about the best is yet to come. And to bring to the light is what Paul says, as he refers to those that are in the darkness. By nature, he's saying to them, their eyes are closed to spiritual things. And when that happens, their perspective on the world changes. Think about current events in our world and how non-believers explain them. Think about how they deal with abortion. Think about how they deal with people that are transitioning to a different sex. Think about how they view the world and think about how they view Christianity. 
it, it's insignificant to their lives because their lives are still in the darkness. And again, that's what Paul is saying is happening in the city of Ephesus as well. They were consumed with the worship of Diana. They were consumed with idol worship. All of these things kept them in the darkness. And Paul wants this a church at Ephesus to be a light to them. And then he's saying once they understand scripture, they will then have a different view on all things. It's only by God's grace that our eyes are opened. And the same thing is true of the Ephesian non-believers. We understood who Jesus is and what the gospel means and what our responsibilities are to fulfill God's plan in our lives and areas of influence we walk in each day. Same message he gave to the Ephesians, he's giving to us through the book of Ephesians, right? We are to be united in Christ within a church comprised of all different socioeconomic, different races, different creeds, all united in Christ, loving one another because of our love for Christ and sharing that message with the world that is in darkness. That's the message then, and that's the message today as well. John Stott, who was a great British preacher, described Paul's writing here like this. He said, the world is a theater. The spectators are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, both good and bad. And basically, the good don't understand salvation, right? They don't understand. They are created beings. The bad have been created beings. All they know is that they are to create chaos and evil. And as they see this plan unfold that we just talked about, the bad ones are sitting there saying, wow, we're losing this battle. It's already done. Christ is risen. He's defeated death. These people are in Christ. We can't, we can't defeat him. The good ones are sitting there saying, we're fascinated by this because we worship Christ all our lives. And now we're seeing a plan that we didn't really understand since the beginning of time to present day, but now it's starting to come into focus. So it's not only coming into focus for the people that are in the city of Ephesus, but it's also coming into the focus of these angels that are in heaven. Stott goes on to say the play is written by God and the actors are those that are saved within the church. And he said the rulers and the authorities and the angelic powers, well, the bad ones, as we said, are devastated as they see the plan play out. Death, de resurrection crushes their hopes as they realize their influence is now limited. They've lost. The good, they're companions of God through eternity. What the heck is going on here? He's born in a manger? This is the creator of the world, born in a manger? I don't understand this. He grew up in a poor household? I don't understand this. He was mocked and betrayed. I don't understand this. But as it plays out, it says the manifold or the multifaceted wisdom of God throughout history is what is unfolding in this play, in this theater. It's utilizing the church to accomplish his overall plan. And it's interesting, when they talk about this manifold wisdom, I, I was trying to think about a way to explain it. A few months back, I, I took a trip to Egypt, and one of the side trips we took was to a rug factory. And we sat in front of this huge rug that was being constructed, and you saw all of these various threads that were being woven into the, into the rug, but really didn't make any sense. And, and, and the guy would keep pushing the loom back and forth, and all of these disparate threads suddenly came together. And when we walked upstairs where the finished rugs were there, you saw the finished product. You saw what they were trying to do. But when you were downstairs, all you saw were these threads that were all over the place and made no sense as you looked at them until you saw the finished product. That's what's happening here, right? These The manifold wisdom of God throughout history seems like they're kind of unrelated threads, but now are being all woven together into this master plan that, that is being revealed to Paul, who in turn is revealing it to the Ephesians. The wisdom of God weaves throughout history thousands of apparently unrelated threads culminating in one beautiful pattern. That's what Paul is saying. There is a plan that now is unfolded, and you are going to be part of it if you're a believer in Christ. And the mystery of God's plan unfolds throughout history. We see that from the New Testament all the way through to the writing of this letter after Christ's crucifixion. There's sin, and then there's God calling sinners to repentance, and there's Christ on the cross, and then the resulting benefit are his church, which are believers in him, formed, 
and then evangelism and eternity with him. That's the plan as it plays all the way through. And we can't sit idly by and say, well, I'm not part of that plan. If you're a believer in Christ, you have a responsibility to be part of God's plan and tell other people about him. Today's society would say that God's plan is failing. The Christians have lost. But God's manifold wisdom shows otherwise as he continues to call non-believers into his kingdom. And he calls them utilizing the church, which is us. And in his manifold wisdom, his plan shows both his love for sinners, but also satisfies his justice in that a sinless Christ was executed, satisfying both things. I mean, it's a masterful plan when you understand all of the, the component parts of it. And the actors, finally, Stott says, are really us in the local churches. The mechanisms that God uses to create a multicultural, united, diverse, and spiritually gifted community to share the gospel. All races, all creeds, and religions are obliterated at the cross. And then this united group of believers called the church demonstrate to the unsaved world what Christianity is really all about. And Paul concludes by saying, yes, I'm in jail, but don't worry about me. I'm fine being in jail for you guys because I'm doing this for your glory. And because you are saved, you now have direct access through Christ to God. Why? Because in his manifold wisdom, this was always his plan. Now, as we conclude tonight, I was thinking this week, how do, how do we summarize something like this? How do we bring this home so that it's applicable to us as well? And so I think it's evident it's all about physics. Now, this week, I was reading a lot about the making of a nuclear bomb. Now, don't panic. Don't call the police. This isn't see something, say something. You'll get my point in a minute. Nuclear bombs are created by a process called fission which is the splitting of atoms that are in uranium. In fact, uranium-235, which is what the core is of most nuclear bombs, contains 92 protons and 143 neutrons. Stay with me, we'll be over this soon. In a bomb, a nuclear bomb, there's a sequence that is started by sending a neutron into an atom of uranium. The atom splits and when it does, it causes the neutrons and protons within that nucleus of the uranium to release, generating a tremendous amount of energy. Okay, that's all the physics we're going to talk about. These neutrons that have been released from the uranium, they smash into other neutrons, right? And so now what we have is causing more splitting of atoms and more neutrons to be released causing an incredible energy all generated off of uranium, which is, is the power source that takes place. And you know what this is called? This is called a chain reaction. And a chain reaction is caused or created when you speed up these neutrons that create, create a tremendous amount of heat. And this sudden release of energy produced by the splitting of the nuclei of the atoms make up the bomb's core and causes the extensive damage when the bomb is dropped. Okay, pretty simple when you look at it that way. In fact, just two pounds of uranium, 235, releases enough energy, which is equivalent to approximately 15,000 tons of dynamite. And the chain reaction only stops when the fissionable material is exhausted. Okay, now that is what it takes to make a nuclear bomb. But notice what I described here, only the neutrons generate the energy. The protons just drift harmlessly until they decay. The positive charge in a proton basically repels them from the nucleus of these other atoms. Compare this to what Paul is saying here in chapter three to the Ephesians. The more Ephesians converted to Christianity, the more the church grew. The more converts, the more people acting like Christ, causing incredible energy and powerful force within that church, 
and within the city of Ephesus. And in God's perfect plan, the gospel was going to spread to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, spread to all nations, races, and creeds. And we see that a super neutron named Paul caused this chain reaction, not only in Ephesus, but in Colossae, in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, and even in Rome. Wow, that's some chain reaction. When Christians are empowered by the Holy Spirit, or uranium, if you want the comparison, there's an endless supply of energy. Within the communities around the world, telling other people about the gospel, all powered by the Holy Spirit, telling them about the power of Christ within their lives and how it caused their lives to change dramatically and to live. That energy, if you will, when deployed to an unsaved world, would have a dramatic impact on non-believers. God's plan becomes apparent. The mystery, all people invited into his kingdom, believers giving access to a tremendous power source, the same power that resurrected Christ, united together in a church with a mandate to live lives that are Christ-like, and most importantly, to tell others why our lives now belong to Christ. Now imagine churches and their congregants all over the world doing the same thing, executing God's plan fueled by the never-ending power of Christ would make any nuclear bomb's power pale in comparison. So the question Paul is asking his Ephesian readers, and more importantly us, is are you a neutron or are you a proton? Is your church a neutron or is it a proton? It's up to us to accept the privilege afforded us to participate in God's perfect plan, a plan that was devised before the foundation of the world was set, revealed to us through the apostles and prophets and scriptures that invite us to share the gospel with unbelievers. Why? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this plan that has been unfolded over the years um, is nothing short of incredible. And Lord, as we think about um, what you did, because you loved us so much to send your only son to provide for us a way to be reconciled from our sin, uh, we have to sit down in amazement and just thank you the way Paul did. And uh, it was unbelievable that that grace would be bestowed on him, a sinner, the worst of all sinners. And yet, Lord, we can apply that same title to our lives as well. And we thank you, Lord, that you provided in your infinite wisdom and your manifold wisdom that there is a way to reconcile to you. Um, we, we should be on our knees thanking you for that. And more importantly, Lord, we should be telling others about it and what it has meant in our life and what it can mean in their lives. And we thank you, Lord, that Paul gave us the direction and the encouragement and the source of power that we too can be part of your plan as well. We ask these things in your name. Amen.